If you've got your Bible open, 1 Peter chapter 1, we're actually going to start in verse 3, because I told you last week, if you were here, that verses 3 through 12 are one sentence. In English, we break it up so it reads better, but originally, it's one long sentence. So we're going to go back, read from verse 3 through verse 12, and we're going to let it all kind of build upon each, each other. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And here's where we're going to pick up this morning, still part of the same sentence. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look." May God bless the the reading and now the teaching of his word. Last week, as we began to just look at this one long sentence, we saw how something was beginning to bubble up in Peter and spill over out of Peter. And I thought about it this week, how how when deep joy and abiding joy in in the person and work of, of God through his son Jesus begins to stir in your soul, how do you find a time to stop when you're explaining what you're thankful for? And so I tried to imagine Peter pointing these readers and now us in the direction of who God is and what he's done, and he just can't find a place to stop. I mean, bless God, bless God, but for this, well, I gotta tell you about this, and he just keeps adding one thing after another, one point of praise after another, and, and so last week we asked ourselves this, what causes us to praise God in a way that's similar to the way Peter does? I mean, what is it about God, his, his person or his work in the past or his work in the present that cultivates this kind of praise or or really this kind of affirmation of who God is and what he's done? I mean, what causes us out of gratitude and affection to affirm God in the same way that that Peter does? And we saw last week that the Bible directs us to affirm or to praise God according to his mighty deeds and according to his excellent mercies. And so last week, as we tackled three through nine, we, we decided to take one thing at a time and really decided to take one day of the week at a time and look at a series of things that Peter says that we could take time each day to sit back and reflect on, to consider, to honestly consider in our hearts uh, what does it mean for God and his excellencies and in his great mercy to be who he is. And let me just remind you of kind of what we saw and and I'm gonna ask you if you took some time last week to think on it and, and wrestle with it. Sunday, last Sunday, we said take some time to just consider, really consider in your heart that God is indeed a God of great mercy. I mean, have you ever considered the fact that God is indeed a God of great mercy. Especially when you think of the fact that in light of who we are and the lack of mercy that we tend to display to others and the fact that the world that we live in is not known for being a merciful place, God, while we were still yet sinners, still yet rebels, still yet aliens to his grace and to his glory, is a God of great mercy. And he sent his son Jesus to live in our place, to die in our place, and to rise from the dead, defeating Satan, sin, and death in our place. And we said, let's Sunday take some time. Just alone in your prayers together with your family or your community, consider what does it mean for God to be a God of great mercy. And then we said Monday, take some time to move on from there and consider the fact that God in his great mercy has caused you to be born again. That if you're a follower of Christ, if you are indeed a Christian, God has caused you by his great mercy to be born again. You're not simply a shinier version of your old self. He didn't simply take the old you and and clean it off. He he caused you to be born again. And we saw a couple weeks ago how in the very beginning of the letter, Peter started off by pointing our attention back to how God does that. That if you are a follower of Christ, before time, God 
knew you and for loved you. He chose to put his love upon you. And in the fullness of his time, according to his wisdom, God the Holy Spirit set you apart for God. He took that heart of stone that at one point had been absolutely lifeless and unaffectionate and unresponsive to the gospel, to the glories of God and the person of Christ. He took it out. And in its place, he put a heart of flesh, sensitive and responsive, tender to the realities of God. And all of that was made possible because of God the Son, Jesus Christ, who died in your place for your sins. Took some, we said, take some time Monday and just consider the fact that God, a God of great mercy, He caused you to be born again. And then we said Tuesday. We haven't even gotten to Wednesday yet. Tuesday, take some time and just consider. Sit back with God's word in prayer with God himself and ask him to stir in you an appreciation and an affection for the fact that God has not only caused you to be born again, he's caused you to be born again to a living hope. That everything we tend to put our hands to and our hope in and our confidence in apart from him is ultimately a dying hope. It doesn't get stronger, and it can't actually come to pass. It's shaky at best is what we talked about. We talked about hope last week as a, as a thing for us that, that we have a, a mild sense of confidence that might come to pass, but we're not really sure if it will actually happen. But God's called us to be born again to a different kind of hope, a, a living hope, a certainty that the desired outcome or the fulfillment of God's promises that he has made to us will come to pass because they're grounded in the person and work of God himself. And that hope isn't dying, it's not stale, it's alive. It's a living hope, growing in strength on a day in and day out basis because Jesus himself is alive. This is what you've been born again to. And this living hope, we said, is meant to give us a perspective, a way of looking at not only who we are, but how we live and how we face the realities of life in this world in which we live. And so we said, take some time Tuesday. Just ask God to stir in you an appreciation for this living hope. And then Wednesday, Wednesday, ask God to stir in you an affection. Consider the fact that God is keeping an inheritance for you. That's what Peter said. He's caused you to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and he's keeping an inheritance for you. This is what God is doing. He's caused you to be born again, but he's caused you to be born again into his family. And God is keeping an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, And unfading, unlike anything else that we can imagine in this life now, God is keeping it for you. We spent some time talking about that last week. And then we said, take some time this week, this past Wednesday, to just think on it. Consider it. Have you ever considered that reality? But not only that, we said Thursday, take some time to consider the fact that not only is God keeping that inheritance for you, but that he's keeping you for that inheritance. He said, what would it be for God to cause us to be born again as as great as that is and call us into his family as great as that is and and keep an inheritance for us as marvelous as that inheritance is? And we talked about it if we weren't sure if we were going to get there. If he then left us up to our own devices to figure out how to get to the point in which we'll see him again and we can receive the inheritance that he has for us. Peter said, no, 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 God is keeping you even now. Guarding you, garrisoning you right now, keeping you for the fulfillment of what he's promised. And we said, take some time. Just consider that. If you've ever sat back and considered that, if you're a Christian, that God right now is guarding you for the very thing he's promised to have for you. And then we said, take some time on Friday to rejoice in something a little bit different. Because Peter, in verse 6, he kind of made a turn. He said in verse 6, in this you rejoice. In this that God's caused you to be born again by his mercy to a living hope, to an inheritance that God's keeping for you undefiled imperishable, unfading. He's keeping it for you. And and have you even thought he's guarding you for that day when you'll see him and and be like him and and receive that inheritance? And Peter says, in all of this, in the fullness of this salvation that God's worked out and is working out for you, you rejoice, even if right now you're being grieved by various trials. Even if right now you are dealing with the realities of life in a fallen world, and we took some time to talk about the fact that even as followers of Christ, we deal with the realities of life in a fallen world. That too many of us have been sold a bill of goods or a lie about what the Christian life is supposed to look like. We've been taught to believe that once we become followers of Christ, all the bumps in the road are supposed to get smoothed out. Life is supposed to look like a life with a lens of rose-colored glasses, and everything's supposed to be good and work out for us. Peter said that's not true. Followers of Christ will be faced with various trials. And those trials are going to cause you to grieve. 
They're going to weigh heavy on you. And they're going to burden you. You will find yourself wrestling with deep and, and an aching sadness over these trials. But Peter says, listen, listen, these trials, they're not permanent. We said take some time Friday to reflect on the fact that these trials, they're not permanent. This grieving is not permanent. Peter said even if you're faced with these trials, even if just for a little while. When Peter said a, a little while, he was talking about life. However many years God has determined for us to live on this earth, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, however many years it is, Peter said, in light of eternity, in light of the fullness of this salvation that God is working out and is ready to reveal to us when he returns that we will be with him for all of eternity, in light of that, this is just life. It's just life. In light of eternity and the presence of God, this is just a little while. It's just a few years. It's not permanent. Now, I was talking with the first service about how sometimes I, I take a, a, a few minutes. It's not often, but I try to imagine eternity, not like what it will be like, but try to get a sense in my head of what forever feels like. Have you ever tried to do that? Like, just try to think, what's it feel like? What, what does forever feel like? And, and just every now and then, I get maybe one, one second, maybe a millisecond glimpse that it's never going to stop. I don't know if you've ever felt that, if you've ever tried it, if you've ever thought about it, ever felt it, you just get this sense, it's never going to stop. And it, it's somewhat overwhelming. And Peter's saying, in light of that, that, that reality of eternity and the presence of God and the fullness of these promises, it, it's just life. These trials, they're not permanent. They have nothing, 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 nothing to compare with the glories that await in eternity. It's just life. And then we said Saturday, one more thing, one more thing Peter pointed us to. Not only are these trials and these, these, this grieving not permanent, but it's not pointless. It's not pointless either. We said take some time yesterday, Saturday, to just consider the fact with God in prayer and with his word that in his kindness and in his mercy and in his purpose, these trials that are grieving us, they're not pointless Peter said, in fact, God is working in the midst of these trials to purify our faith, a faith that we'll have within our hands on the day when Jesus returns, a something that will be more precious than gold or anything else that we can imagine, and it's being refined in the midst of these trials, in the midst of these various disturbances and, and stumbling blocks and trials that we're dealing with. What rises to the surface very often are all of the impurities, all of the misplaced hopes, all the places where we've grasped dying hopes in this world that can never promise or never fulfill what they promise. And Peter says those trials reveal what's in there, what needs to be repented of, what needs to be confessed of, what needs to be cleaned off of the power of the Holy Spirit. And what's left is a purified faith. This is the purifying, cultivating work of God the Holy Spirit, conforming our soul to reflect the character of Christ. It's not pointless. And not only that, not only is it not pointless, but we realize, we saw how Peter directed our attention to that day when, when Jesus does return and we see him face to face and the impulse of a follower of Christ is gonna be to worship, just to praise him for who he is and, and we're seeing then the fulfillment of that promise and the glory of that day and Peter said, not only are we going to worship him for who he is and praise him in the midst of it, but here's the greatest thing of all, we're gonna get it in return. He's gonna look at his followers and he's gonna say, I, I saw you. I saw you when your body was broken. I saw the 10, the 15, the 20 years of pain when you didn't even get out of the bed in the morning because your body hurt so bad and yet you believed me. You still believed me that was good. I saw you when you buried the one you loved and you still believed me. You still knew I was good. We already know from the gospels he's gonna look at his followers and say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. And we said, this is part of the beauty of the gospel promise that Jesus lived the life that you and I were created to live. He lived it in our place. And then Jesus willingly died in our place for our sin. And on that cross, Jesus, in his body, took everything that you and I deserved. I mean, think of what our sin deserves. We took time to talk about it a bit last week. I can't go too far this week. But think of all the things that our sin deserves. Jesus took that upon himself on that cross, and on that cross, he exhausted the fullness of God's wrath in our place so that when he returns, we, as his people, will receive everything that he deserves. That's what's awaiting us. That's what Peter's pointing us to. There's going to be praise when he returns. 
There's going to be praise towards him, but we're going to hear affirmation from him. And when he brings that kind of affirmation to us and we receive what he deserves, we turn right back around and praise him because it's only because of him that it was even possible. This is what we have to look forward to. And we said, take some time this week to just consider that. These various trials, they're not pointless. They're purifying a faith in us, and they, they are building for us the day when a praise will come not only from us to him, but from him to us. Unbelievable if you actually think about it. Take some time. I hope you took some time yesterday to just consider that and what it meant. But here's the thing. He's not done. He's got one more thing. Remember, it's one sentence. It just keeps spilling one thing after another. He's got, he's got one more thing, and we saved it for one Sunday. We didn't try to cram it in last week because when you read it, you're kind of like, well, where did that come from? But, but he's saying something really important that I think if we would just grasp, if as followers of Christ, we just grab it, take some time to consider it, and let God stir an affection for us in it, I, I think it would make all the difference in the world for us. And you see it in verse 10 through 12. And here's what it is. Today, Sunday, Sunday to Sunday, take some time. Later today, with your family, with your friends, just you and God alone with your Bible. And consider the preciousness of your position in Christ. Consider the preciousness of your position in Christ. Now, I chose that word precious specifically. There were a couple other words I wanted to work with that I actually tried to work with and and kind of had a direction going in, but, but I came back to this word precious. I mean, do you know what the word precious actually means? The dictionary, we're going to go with the dictionary. The dictionary says that precious means something of great value or highly esteemed. Something of great value, of of high estimation. And so let me ask you this morning as we get into verses 10 and 12. Have you ever considered the preciousness, the nature of the great value, the high estimation of your position in Christ? Have you ever actually considered that? Well, let's look at verses 10 through 12 and, and see what Peter has to say about it. And here's what I'm going to do. Like last week, I'm just going to try to expose what Peter's saying here. I, I've got no real agenda to get you to a series of things that I want you to do. Peter's just trying to point us in a direction. He's just trying to focus our eyes and focus our attention and our hearts upon God. And that's all I'm trying to do is expose this to you. And I'm going to trust that God's going to do what he's going to do with his word. That's, that's all we're going to try to do. So don't be waiting for the hook to come in later. I've I got nothing for you but what's right here. So let's see what Peter has to say. Verse 10. Concerning this salvation. So remember, it's one sentence. So concerning all that we just spent the entire week considering. What God has done from eternity past to make you his own. How his mercy has caused you to be born again to a, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus to an inheritance. Imperishable undefiled, unfading, kept for you, and he's keeping you for it. And even though it's tough right now and and things are tough, you're going through various trials, it's not permanent. It's not pointless. God's working in them, considering all of this, all that God is doing by his great mercy. Look at what he says. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It seems like Peter shifted to a different gear. Now all of a sudden he's bringing in the prophets. Man, who, who are the prophets? When Peter's talking about the prophets, he's just referring back to the great men and women, the prophetic men and women of the old covenant day. He's talking about Abraham, talking about Moses, talking about Isaiah, talking about Daniel, talking about Jeremiah. He's talking about the prophets. These were men and women who were called to their task by God. And God called them to be his spokesmen. God called them to be his ambassadors. God called them to speak the message of the king to the king's people in the king's place according to the time in which the king determined. This is what the prophets did. And here's what I want you to capture because I want to try to get to the other side of it. No one woke up one day with an anticipation and a desire to become a prophet. This wasn't a career trajectory that people went on. Kids didn't sleep in rooms at night with pictures of prophets up on the wall. The majority of God's prophets in their day were despised. They were opposed. They were rejected. Some of them, not all of them, were killed. It wasn't one of these things that everybody aspired to, but these were people that God chose for the task that he had for them. It was an amazing task in and of itself. And I don't say this in any way to demean 
eternity, because we talk about it here all the time, and it's so great. I, I don't want you to hear me trying to demean it at all, but if in eternity God were to create a Mount Rushmore of sorts, of the great saints of old, looking back, that cast, cast our attention back to what God did through his people of old, these would be the people that were on the Mount Rushmore. That's the position the prophets have in the people of God. These were great men and, and some great women of God that God chose to speak his word to his people. He actually informed them of the message that he wanted them to communicate in a particular time to a particular people according to a particular circumstance. They were with God. God spoke to them directly. God's spirit was upon them. But here's the thing. They weren't omniscient. You gotta catch this. They weren't omniscient. They were human. They didn't know everything. They didn't know the full and extent of of God's mind. God gave them a particular message to give to his people. And what Peter is saying is that Oftentimes, God would give his prophets a message to his people, and it was always for a particular time and in a particular circumstance, but sometimes that message had a bit of a future orientation to it. It seemed like sometimes the message that God's prophets would give his people that God had given them was looking forward towards something. What Peter is saying is when that was happening, they didn't fully understand the ramifications of what they were communicating to God's people, and they were really, really, really desirous to know what God was talking about. I mean, what did all of this actually look like? Well, let me give you an example. Uh, we have time. I did it in the first one. We'll do it in this one. One of the most famous ones, Prophet Isaiah. Here, here's what I'm talking about. Let's listen to this. He is speaking a message that God has given him for God's people in the place where they are, in the time in which they are, in the context of which they are, but it's got, it's got this thing about it. it it's kind of got a future look to it. L- listen to what Isaiah said. You may be familiar with this. He said, Behold, My servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, and he's talking about this same man, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men would hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely, He's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned every one of us to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, he was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him with portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. What? Who, who? Who did this? Or who's going to do this? And who took my iniquity? And who took the iniquity of us all? And who is God then going to make prosperous even after his death? Who, who is this? And, and Peter said the prophets were given these messages by God to speak to God's people, but in particular about this one who was going to suffer. And then there were going to be glories on the other end of this suffering, and they didn't fully get it. So they searched. And they inquired. 
Peter says the prophets themselves, these great men and women of God, the ones that would be on that, that, that Mount Rushmore of faith in eternity, they searched and inquired. Most likely they inquired of the scriptures and they even inquired of their own prophecies that would probably be written down. Who is this? I mean, what are you talking about? How is this going to be fulfilled? I love how casually I tend to read that, that, that they searched and they inquired. And, and this week I was smacked across the face by the reality that that, that particular idea that they inquired of these prophecies and they inquired of what God had called them to speak, that's the same way that you and I would talk about ransacking a house. That's what that word means. You imagine ransacking a house, looking for something so valuable, so precious to you that you leave nothing unturned. You don't care the damage that you cause to your house and your property because you've got to find whatever it is you're looking for. So you will tear that house apart and leave nothing undone because you've got to find it. This is what was going on in the hearts and the lives of these prophets who were speaking God's message. They wanted to know, well, how is this going to work? I mean, who is this man? Have we missed it? Is it yet to come? How are you going to do this, God? And here's what Peter said. You know what was revealed to them? Peter said... What God revealed to them in that was that they weren't serving themselves. They were serving you. That's what God told them. The great men and women of old that God called to speak his message to his people, the great Mount Rushmore of faith, if you allow me to have that analogy, God said, here's what I want you to know. You're serving a future people. I'm not going to tell you how it's all going to work. Can you imagine that? I'm not going to tell you. You're not going to get to know right now what I mean and how this is all going to work out. But here's the thing. Here's why I ask. Have you ever considered the preciousness of your position? Because in God's wisdom and according to his great mercy, he has caused you to be born again in a time in which you not only can know how it all works out, but you now get to experience his grace through this man himself. You now know who these sufferings occurred to. You now know who suffered this stuff. You now know what it meant for Jesus to live and to die in your place. You now know of the subsequent glories that are yet to come in eternity, and you get to experience it. Have you ever considered how precious your position is? The prophets didn't get to know what you know. They died in faith, looking forward to the fulfillment that God had promised. You get to know it. You get to experience it. You've been transformed by it. You live daily according to it. This is the preciousness of our position as followers of Christ. This was an intense topic of interest for these prophets. This is what they wanted to know, but God didn't let them know. He didn't give them the answers, but yet you and I get to know. We're the recipients of what they so desperately wanted to understand. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered that this is the preciousness of your position right now as a follower of Christ? Peter said, these things that have now been announced to you, this good news, this good news is the announcement of how all of those prophecies in the Old Testament have been fulfilled now in the person and work of Jesus. This good news, this what you have now been told, these are things into which angels long to look. Have you ever stopped at that one? I mean, if you just flown by that when you've read this and said, I'll come back to that one later. This is how Peter punctuates a sentence. Remember, one sentence, just streams of praise, streams of things that are bubbling up at him, things that he's just affirming, the great excellencies and mercies of God, and he punctuates it with this salvation, all these things, even the angels long to look. Like, boom, like if I had a mic, you know, like Peter, just drop it. This is supposed to weigh on you in a really good way. This is supposed to, like, to sit on you and make you sit back and, and consider something. Peter didn't say that the angels longed, past tense, to look into this salvation. So that, that when Jesus had been born on this earth and lived that life in our place and died in our place and then rose from the grave, now the angels are fine. Great, we saw it. We're no longer longing to understand it. Peter says, no, 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 no. Right now, now here's what got me all week, and I hope it somehow clarifies just the preciousness of this to you. As Peter was writing this letter, and now, as you and I are reading it and studying it, these angels are longing to look into these things and understand them more fully. I mean, they have a completely different vantage point than you and I have. 
And so what Peter is saying in, in some way is it, it must mean that these angels have this holy desire to see how the glories of the gospel are playing themselves out in your life right now today. And they're looking in. And they're looking in. They're, they're watching. They're, they're observing life right now. They're observing God's people. They're observing how the gospel is changing us and how the fullness of these prophecies through Jesus and this subsequent glory and salvation is working itself out in our life right now. And they're just absolutely intrigued by it. The angels long to look into this. And so while we talked a little bit about what this church was going through back in the day, how the world may may look at you because you're a follower of Christ and and make fun of you and and call your faith weak-minded and and ignorant and begin to mock you and and malign you, Uh, listen to this. This is from the theologian named Wayne Grudem. He said that even though the world may mock you, angels who see life from the ultimate reality of God's perspective find you, find Christians to be objects of intense interest. Listen. For they know that these struggling believers, you and me, are actually the recipients of God's greatest blessings and honored participants in a great drama that is the focal point of an entire universal history. Have you ever considered the preciousness, the great value, the high estimation of your position in Christ? The Old Testament prophets, they didn't get to know. The angels, completely different vantage point, longing to see how this is going to play itself out in your life. And you, you get to know. You get to experience. You get to be transformed by this great salvation because of the mercies of God. And here's why this matters. Remember, Peter wrote this letter to these churches, to churches just like you and I, because they were beginning to undergo difficulties because of their faith, right? Remember, if you were around, he said in chapter 4, we're going to get to it later, that now because of your faith and your subsequent changes in your life, all of your former friends now make fun of you. They now malign you. They're mocking you. You're being overlooked for things. You're being cut out of things because you're a follower of Jesus now. There are various trials in your life, and you're being grieved by them. Here's why it matters. Have you ever heard the phrase or the statement or read it on a bumper sticker that the Christian life is not a sprint, it's a marathon? You ever heard that? Been around church for a while? This week I heard someone say, you know, the Christian life is not like a marathon. It's more like an Ironman. Two-mile swim, 112-mile bike, 26-mile run with no stopping. I thought he might actually be on to something. But then I thought as I was reading this and and just studying this and praying through this, what would be the most accurate way to get to where I'm going? I thought, yeah, it might be an Ironman if they let the designers of the Spartan death race determine the course. That probably is more accurate. So fine, swim two miles. But have you ever swam two miles with electrical wire in the water and tried to avoid it? That's probably closer to it. That's fine. You get to bike 112 miles, but you get to do it with no gears. Maybe on a tricycle. In mud. And then when you make it through that, you got to run 26 miles. That's fine. But there's going to be people behind trees jumping out with sticks and hitting you. And you've got to do it barefooted. Welcome to the Christian life. It's like a Spartan death, death race Iron Man. And here's the, here's the thing. Nobody tells us this. If you're going to turn on anything or pick up any book today, the majority of them are going to tell you that the Christian life is supposed to be a life where the bumps in the road are completely smoothed out. By believing certain things and saying certain things and doing certain things, no various trials, no hard times, no struggles. It's just not true. It's just not true. And here's why it matters. Listen to the Bishop J.C. Ryle. He's a great teacher. Listen to what he said. He said, you and I as a Christian, we have a race to run, right? We have a race to run. And it's more like a Spartan death race than a sprint or a marathon. But without, from without outside of us, there's going to be fighting. From within, there are going to be fears. There will be snares to be avoided and temptations to be resisted. There will be your own treacherous heart, often cold and dead and dry and dull. There will be friends, and they're going to give you unsound advice. And there are going to be relationships who will even war against your own soul. In short, there will be stumbling blocks on every side. 
There will be occasion for all of your diligence, all of your watchfulness, all of your godly jealousy, and all of your prayer. And you'll find something out really soon. He said, you'll soon find out that to be a Christian is no light matter. Various trials that will grieve you. It's a race, but it's not smooth. And how do you go through this race without tapping out? I mean, how do you get through it without finding the first off-ramp from the course to go sit down, take a soak, get some water, and just watch everybody else? I mean, how do you make it through without actually quitting? Because if we're really obvious, if you've been doing this for any period of time at all, you've come to the place where you've told yourself that it was a lot easier to believe in the beginning. It was a lot easier in the very beginning to believe in Christ than it is to continue believing right now. Because it's hard, and it's costing me something. And there's hurt, and there's grief. How do we get through it without quitting? The writer of the book of Hebrews said something, and it's going to help unpack what Peter said. He said, you and I as Christians, he said, there's a great cloud of witnesses in eternity. Right now, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. You know who some of those witnesses are? Those prophets, those great men and women of old. And we're surrounded by a great cloud of such witnesses. And the writer said, let us then lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely and let us run. We've got a race to run. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Obstacles on every side, various trials, snares everywhere, tripping us up, weighing us down, burdening us, grieving us. How do we run it with patience? How do we run it to the end? How do we not quit? How do we lay aside everything that's weighing us down and causing so much trouble? Listen to what he says. Verse two, he says, look to Jesus. And here's how you run your race. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. How do you deal with various trials and grief? How do you deal with a race that you've got to run with patience that is gonna be weighed down not only by your own sin but from struggles within this world? You do it by keeping your focus upon Jesus. And so the apostle Peter writes to a group of churches just like you and I and he writes to you and I right now and he says, here's why I'm writing, remember? I'm gonna help you to remember the true grace of God the true nature of God's mercy and salvation so that you can stand firm. And here's how Peter gets it started. He said, here's how you run this race. You gotta remember. You gotta remember that the mercy of God before time, before the ages even began, he chose to set his love upon you. And in the fullness of time, you've got to remember and you've got to consider and focus on that he chose to set you apart by his spirit and to give you a new heart that delighted in him. And he did that through the work of his son. And by his mercy, you've got to keep your eyes on this. By his mercy, he caused you to be born again. And he caused you to be born again to a living hope and to an inheritance that's unlike anything you can imagine. And he's keeping it safe for you. But you know what? He's keeping you safe for it. Keep your eyes on him. He's keeping you safe for it. You're going to deal with a hard time. It's going to get hard. There are going to be trials. You can't minimize the trials. You can't act like they're not there. You grieve in the midst of them. And that's okay, but you can rejoice. There can be real and deep joy, real peace, real joy inside of you because it's tethered not to the world around you, but it's tethered to the confidence that you have in who God is and what he's doing and how he's going to fulfill his promise. You've got a living hope that is tethered to you. So you can rejoice because even right now, it's hard. It's not permanent. You've got to keep your eyes on that. It's not permanent. And you know what? It's not pointless. It's working out something in you and it's working something for you that's going to be revealed when it comes. And here's the thing, you've got to keep your eyes on who he is and what he's done. You've got to consider and find joy in the fact that your position as his is a precious position. The Old Testament prophets didn't get what you get. The angels are longing to look into how this is gonna play out. You get to know it and you get to experience it. Have you ever considered how precious your position in Christ is? really is. The wisdom of God in eternity past conceived of a way for the love of God to satisfy the wrath of God without compromising the justice of God and thereby make this great salvation available for sinners like you and me. And he did it through the sufferings and the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ so that according to his wisdom, by his great mercy, 
He could cause you to be born again. You've got to keep your eyes on Him. Jesus is the sum and the substance and the means of this great salvation. This is what Peter is pointing our attention to. He's saying the Holy Spirit spoke of all of this through the prophets of old, predicting the grace that was to be yours that would come through this suffering and through this glory and and resurrection of Jesus. And though they wanted to fully understand what all of that meant, I mean, you've got to imagine how desperate these men who talked to God were to fully understand what God was saying. They wanted to know. And all God told them was that, you know what? You're serving others. You're serving this people that Peter's writing to. They were serving you, and they were serving me. And that same Holy Spirit that inspired that message inspired the proclamation of the good news of this fulfillment that you've heard. And you've heard it. And according to God's wisdom, he By his Holy Spirit, that same Spirit gave you a new heart to receive it. And now God has caused you in that to be born again. This is the good news of your salvation. This is what we keep our attention and our focus on that allows us to run this race, though grieve with various trials and not quit. What a God. What a Savior. What a salvation. What a precious position. If you're a follower of Christ, take some time today. Ask yourself, have have you ever really considered just how precious, just of what great value, of what high estimation your position in Christ really is because of his great mercy? Take some time today to do that. And all of it, here's what I love, and here's how I wrap it up. All of this, this one great just cascading sentence that Peter is writing, he sums the whole thing up here in the end with a word. A word. Grace. This this great salvation, this speaks of all the saving acts of God. It speaks of all that God did to cause you to be born again through the work of His Spirit and through the work of His Son. But this word, grace, not only encapsulates all that God does, but it brings in the motive behind it. It brings in God's motive behind how he has saved you. The prophets poured over this grace. The Spirit inspired the speaking of this grace. The apostles and the prophets declared this grace. The angels longed to look in and fully understand how this grace is working itself out in you. And you and I, we get to enjoy it. We get to enjoy this grace and experience this grace. May you enjoy it. May you enjoy it. Enjoy it. Let me pray for us this morning. Oh, the, the greatness of your excellencies, the extent of your mighty acts. And God, sometimes they're so uh, overwhelming that it, it feels impossible to even stand up and try to communicate them. Lord, I thank you for your word that reveals to us who you are. It reveals to us the greatness of your excellencies, that we can know you for who you are. It reveals to us your mighty deeds, your mighty acts of mercy on our behalf for your glory and and our joy. And I just ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, will take your words and and whatever I have have said that honors that and exposes that, you would use it to transform our hearts, draw us to you, if not for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, that we may see you, be stunned by you, be awed by you, be brought to our knees by you. We may see the depth of your mercy towards us and may it cultivate in us by your grace an, an appreciation and a gratitude that spills out like Peter's. This is what we want, God. We want to know you, be known by you, to love you deeply, to love you truly, to love you fully. We ask that you would do that by your spirit in our hearts. We ask that you do this in the name of Jesus for his sake. Amen.